Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Welcome back to War and Peace. I'm your host, uh, Olga Ulker, sitting at my desk uh, talking into a recorder. And I'm your co-host, Hugh Pope, likewise in Brussels. With us today is Alexandra Deer. Alexandra Deer is the Gender Coordinator at the United Nations Security Council Counterterrorism Executive Directorate. She has been in that role for two years, and she is the first person to have that job of the Gender Coordinator with that organization. So, Alexandra, I thought I would start off by asking you you what the Counterterrorism Executive Directorate does at the United Nations uh, Security Council and how you fit in. Well, thank you so much. And thanks so much for having me on your podcast. So what the Counterterrorism Executive Directorate or CTED does is look at UN member states' implementation of the Security Council's counterterrorism resolutions. And so we assess the, the way in which these resolutions are implemented by states across the world. It's a global mandate that we have. We look also at the latest trends and developments uh, in terrorism and in counterterrorism and uh, try to flag to the Security Council issues that need to be taken up as we face new challenges in that space. And to maybe explain a little bit in terms of uh, the spectrum of measures that we look at in that regard, we don't look at what many f- people often focus on, which is sort of the military side of counterterrorism operations. Our spectrum of activity ranges from everything to do with legislation and the criminal justice side of countering terrorism, law enforcement issues, border control, how to counter terrorism on the internet, in the online space, how to counter the financing of terror and so-called CVE, so countering violent extremism measures, which includes a lot of community outreach, counter-narratives, and cooperation with, with civil society. And then across all of these issues, we make sure that our approach is fully compliant with human rights considerations and also gender. And that is where my work then comes into it. So before you had this job was... Nobody just paying much attention to the gender component? How did it work? And just what do you see as the greatest challenge of ensuring that uh, gender is appropriately incorporated? So the integration of gender in the counterterrorism space is something that was lagging behind for a a long time. As you might know, we are currently uh, celebrating the, the 20th anniversary of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, Resolution 1425. And so we have been working on integrating gender perspectives into the work we do on conflict prevention and conflict resolution for over two decades at this point. In the counterterrorism space, the Security Council Resolution that gave us a mandate to integrate gender perspectives into counterterrorism was only adopted in 2015. So we're looking at five years of uh, doing that work in a more focused and a more more structured way. There there have, of course, been initiatives before, but but really in terms of having a mandate and having a dedicated work stream to look at these issues. It's still relatively recent. uh, And I think uh, looking back at those five years, we've seen some important progress and also some, some continued challenges. Can you tell us a few areas where you've really seen change? So I think we have made progress in terms of the overall awareness that gender is an important part of counterterrorism, that we have to take gender into consideration and that we have to make sure that counterterrorism responses are gender sensitive. And so I think if you look at what can we take as a sort of hard indicators of progress, if we look at language and security council resolutions over the past five years, you will see increasingly that there is reference in different thematic resolutions to ensuring that a gender sensitive approach is being taken when we deal with various terrorism challenges. We see the same at the national level in various action plans and overarching policy strategies where this issue uh, will increasingly be mentioned. We see really an exponential growth of research and analysis in this area, which is so important to give us a, a more nuanced understanding of the various ways in which gender and terrorism and violent extremism intersect, and therefore what needs to be taken up at the policy level. So I think we've had progress on that front. 
But where we have real challenges now is in terms of a practical implementation. I think it's very easy to say and, and to acknowledge that counterterrorism measures should be gender sensitive. Sure, makes sense. But what does that actually mean? And what does it mean to do that well? Those are still questions that we are grappling with and that, that many of, of the implementers of the ground, so national governments as well as, as other partners and stakeholders are, are very much trying to figure that out and to improve practice in that way. So some of the problems are that responses are gendered, but not necessarily gender sensitive, that women, men are treated differently but not in ways that necessarily reflect the way that they're recruited or participate differently. Is that an accurate way of looking at the problem? Yes, I think actually you're pointing to something that is really important and that is a big gap, in fact, that we have in this area, which is that we very often think about gender still as something that relates to women. And we don't look at gender from the perspective of men or as something that applies to men as well. But terrorist groups do. And they are, in fact, very, very skillful at tailoring their narrative and their recruitment strategies to men and in a way that taps into gendered dynamics and gender inequalities, frustrations around male identity and being able to the way in which they promote a certain notion of masculinity, which is a notion of masculinity that is hyper aggressive and violent, that depends on the subjugation of women, that very often entails violence against women. Uh, and they are able to draw on the frustrations of men in different local contexts. So these groups are able to appeal to male feelings of disempowerment, of resentment, and to build that into their recruitment strategies. And unfortunately, in our efforts to counter and prevent that type of propaganda and these types of recruitment strategies, we typically don't address these gendered notions. And we're not as, as skillful at tapping into these gender dynamics and at, at challenging these very harmful gender norms that these groups perpetuate. And I think that looking at how we can improve that, how we can include an appeal to alternative, more peaceful notions of masculinity in our efforts to prevent and counter violent extremism is something that is still missing and that I hope we will be trying to address going forward. And when you are looking at the studies that are flowing across your desk, I mean, do you see that the actors or the victims or the people sucked into these terrorist groups are radicalizing in different ways according to whether they are women or men? That's actually a very complex question because I think what we have found, and if you look at how the literature has evolved, there has been an evolution from very basic assumptions around male and female radicalization being different and male radicalization being something that is a lot more political, that is a lot more rational, that goes back to certain convictions and beliefs that these men hold, whereas female radicalization has often been portrayed as something that is a lot more emotional, it's a lot more personal, it's purely on the basis of certain experiences that these women have had. One of the very typical stories around that is if last one of your male relatives, your son or husband, then you might join these groups and so forth. And I think the literature has made a lot of progress in debunking some of these gendered myths and in advancing a much more nuanced understanding of radicalization in its gender dimension and in general. I mean, it's also, it's not a linear process. It's a much more complex interplay of different factors and of pathways into these groups. And so we see now that when it comes to men and women, many of these underlying factors and this mosaic of different elements that come into it are not dissimilar in that they comprise a mix of grievances, of structural conditions, and of individual fact and beliefs. But nonetheless, there are, of course, differences in terms of how men and women are then specifically recruited into these groups or how they find themselves in these groups, sometimes voluntarily and sometimes also not voluntarily. I think that's also something that is important to underline, that there is, of course, also a lot of grooming and exploitation that happens. So I think there has been definitely uh, an evolution that has allowed us to look at these factors in a more nuanced way, 
for both genders. And I mean, for men as well, since I mentioned the, the aspect of uh, personal factors and emotional factors and identity, I think it's very clear. And we touched on this when we just talked about the issue of masculinity. We see that for men as well, this is not just this, this rational process, right? It also has to do with the conditions they find themselves in, the very personal experiences that they have, notions around masculinity and expectations and societal pressures that are being put on them. And when there is a sense that they cannot live up to these expectations, when well, then that becomes an opportunity for extremist groups to tap into that and to exploit that. So we're talking about this in a very binary way, right? That it's men, that it's women. How would you talk about people who don't fit in that binary and how any of this affects them? Yeah, so I think that is something that is, of course, relevant as well and has not received much attention uh, so far. I think we have been making an effort to advance an understanding of gender that doesn't just equal women and that also includes men. And I think there is then a further challenge to actually look also at non-binary ideas of gender, as well as to understand gender in its real sense of the word as a relational term, as a term that allows us to analyze and question underlying power structures and power dynamics. I mean, I would think to some extent, right, if you've got an ideologies that appeal in part by polarizing gender, by saying, this is where you fit, right, you are male or you are female, for somebody who isn't actually that comfortable, it could either be an attack or it can be appealing and that it resolves a lot of questions. And encountering that, allowing for some of the nuance and some of the complexities of gender as it's experienced, could actually be very helpful in responding, at least in some cases. I don't know if that's anything anybody's exploring. What I have seen is some research and some analysis being done when it comes to the specific targeting of LGBTQI communities, specifically by ISIL in Iraq, to make sure that, you know, when we talk about the gender-based crimes that ISIL committed, that includes uh, not only women and girls, but it includes gender minorities that is based on sexual orientation as well. So that is an important aspect. Beyond that, I have to say that not much work has been done in this space so far. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. You're listening to War and Peace, a podcast of the International Crisis Group, and we're talking to Alexandra Deer about gender, terrorism, and counterterrorism. So, Alexandra, what we've been talking about up until now seems to reflect responding to terrorist groups that have very, they would call it traditional, right? Somebody else might call them reactionary ideologies, one with very binary views of gender, among other things. This is not what terrorism always is, right? I mean, terrorism in the 80s tended to be left wing. How are you thinking now about the ways that different groups use terrorism and might also differently use gender? Is that something you're integrating into your work? Yeah, certainly. I think we do make clear in our work that, in fact, we will look at terrorism, at international terrorism that is perpetrated in association with any kind of ideology. So yes, absolutely. Thank you for that question, because I think it is really important to point out that we don't look at just one particular type of international national terrorism, but that we look at really the full spectrum. And one of the newer developments that we are increasingly looking at is the emergence of extreme right-wing terrorism. And that phenomenon also has a lot of very interesting and important gender dimensions. But it does speak to your point that actually in the current terrorism landscape, what we see as a common denominator among most of these groups is a deep misogynistic ideology. It plays out in different ways, but it is there. And so in the case of the extreme right, that is a very important factor. It's a deeply misogynistic ideology that intersects in important ways with the racist, anti-Semitic and xenophobic views that these groups propagate. 
And uh, so we are actually facing a situation that is not dissimilar in terms of how we've been looking at the gender dimensions of a group like ISIL. We see that gender is important when it comes to the ideology of these groups. It's important in terms of how these groups use uh, and exploit gender dimensions in their narratives, in their recruitment strategies, also in how they operate, and that women also play an important part in these movements. This is also something that is is sometimes overlooked, or we assume because they are so violently misogynistic that they wouldn't appeal to women. But that is actually not the case. So in terms of government response to these groups, and its response to women who participated, because there's a strong female role in the Islamic State, as well as some of these far-right groups. Do you think government policies are evolving and how do you see them evolving to better accommodate gender dynamics? What are some good things governments do and maybe what are some less good things that you've seen come out in policy? Yeah, I think that's a really complex overall picture, I think, that we are seeing in this regard. I think we are seeing many governments that are trying to take gender into consideration and to develop approaches that are more gender sensitive sensitive. We see others where that awareness has not really made its way into policy and into practice to the extent that that we would perhaps like. But I think what is a common challenge to everybody is to really learn how to do this well in this space. One of the shortcomings that we still have is that we have very limited sort of best practice type of guidance. There is very limited evaluation and learning so far in terms of what works, what doesn't work. And it's certainly one of the areas where more is needed in terms of actually assessing what the impact and what the gendered impact of counterterrorism measures uh, actually is. But let's perhaps talk about some specific examples, some of the challenges that we have seen in this space and some of the attempts to do better and to incorporate more gender sensitive perspectives into counterterrorism. I think one of the areas you've alluded to this is how governments have responded to women who have joined ISIL in Syria and Iraq. And we are now facing the massive challenge of those individuals returning from the conflicts. And how do you deal with that? And how do you deal with that in a gender sensitive manner and in a way that is based and founded understanding of these very complex factors? that lead, as we were discussing earlier, the complex ways in which women get radicalized and find their ways into these groups. How do you incorporate a a nuanced understanding of the different roles that they perform inside these groups? And some of these roles are violent roles, some of these roles are nonviolent support roles. How do you deal with that? Have these specific acts been criminalized uh, in your national legislation? Are you able to prosecute them for those actions? Are you able to find the right evidence, the, the necessary evidence that is also admissible in a court of law in your jurisdiction as opposed to, you know, the crime has been committed thousands of miles away in a war zone, right? How do you prove what actually happened there? How do you reconstruct these events? And in the case of women, some of these questions are particularly challenging to answer. And uh, we see states very much both making an effort, but also struggling to meet those challenges. And one of the things that we have learned is that it is really a matter of building up more expertise and more capacity on these issues to help member states, help their judicial system, help their law enforcement authorities to know how to actually deal with this in a manner that is both compliant with the rights of those individuals, as well as uh, effective in terms of the outcome. Our colleagues at Crisis Group have, have done a lot of work on the issue of returning people from the camps in Syria. And they're also going ahead uh, later this year with a campaign in support of the 20th anniversary of UNSCR 1325. And I was just wondering from your perspective, where you sit in the counterterrorism world, I mean, what kind of things need to be really achieved in the near future that a group like Crisis Group could push for? I think there are a lot of things that we are still hoping to achieve in this space. And there are some very specific issues and there are some broader issues as well. I know that at Crisis Group, you have done some really important work on on the issue of the women and children and families associated with ISIL, many of whom are still stuck in camps in northeastern Syria and the questions around their return. I know that the situation remains unresolved and progress has been very 
very piecemeal. At the same time, there is the situation of the local, the Iraqi and Syrian women who are also affected by the situation, many of whom are also in these camps, many more who are in situations of internal displacement, and their situation has not received the same kind of attention as that of the foreign women who find themselves in those camps. So that is something very specific where I think more advocacy is required and more work is required to make sure that when dealing with these women and with their families, we make sure, first of all, that they are not forgotten. And second of all, that we put in place measures to ensure both that justice is done and that they are able to rehabilitate and reintegrate into their communities. And so these are also things that require not just a focus on the individual, but it requires a real community-based approach. So that is something very specific. And then in terms of overarching issues, as I mentioned earlier, I think that really there is so much work to be done across the board, across the full spectrum of counterterrorism measures to move from rhetoric to action and to move towards action and practice that is nuanced, that is built on an understanding, not just of different gender dynamics and gendered roles, but also has an understanding of the gendered impacts of counterterrorism measures. So there is still a lot more work ahead of us. It's a good place to close, but I'm going to ask one one more question. Because when we talk about women and children, right, it's this grouping together. And we've done this too at Crisis Group. But one has to ask, okay, what about men and children? This does seem very much a reflection of a very gendered view of this, that the children are the women's responsibility, that the children belong with their mothers. But what does happen to the father? Is it part of the problem when we respond this way? Yeah, I think we have seen instances in the response where that sort of very gendered understanding of let's group the women and children together and then the men we deal with as in their role as terrorist actors, right? But not in relation to women, not in relation to children. Whereas for women and children, not only do we group them together, but we often see that women are then predominantly seen in their role as mothers. And that is reflected down to things such as what we've seen in the criminal justice system. I've done some analysis on prosecution practices of uh, returnees from ISIL. And one of the very, uh, very striking findings was that a number of women, a considerable number of women actually, who uh, had been prosecuted in different countries were prosecuted for crimes committed against their own children in their role as mothers. So they were convicted of a child abduction, of sort of neglect of their parental duty of care towards their children. I have not found a single case of a man who joined ISIL being prosecuted in his role as as a father. And so I do think that these gendered ways of thinking about different roles of men and women are then are reflected in our counterterrorism responses in these different ways. Alexandra, thank you so much for joining us. There's clearly a lot more to discuss and also a great deal of work to do. I'm looking forward, I hope, to more conversations and more thinking through of ways to make the responses better. Thank you so much. No, thank you. It was a pleasure to talk to you. The UN Security Council Counterterrorism Committee's latest work on this topic is an analytical brief, The Prosecution of ISIL-Linked Women. You can find it on the CTED website, which is www.un.org forward slash SC forward slash CTC. Then I've got another forward slash. I don't know if you need it. You can also follow Alexandra Deer on Twitter. She's clearly enough at Alexandra Deer. Alexandra is spelled A-L-E-K-S-A-N-D-R-A-D-I-E-R. And for more of Crisis Group's work on gender and on returning fighters and affiliates, do check out the Gender and Conflict page on our website, which is crisisgroup.org forward slash gender and conflict. It has to be said, though, that we, like Alexandra's team, also strive to incorporate gender-sensitive analysis in all of our work. You should also follow Crisis Group and us on Twitter. Uh, Crisis Group is at Crisis Group. Uh, Hugh is at Hugh underscore Pope. And I'm at Olya, O-L-Y-A, Olaker. Uh, Also check us out on Facebook and Instagram, which is also at Crisis Group. And do please also feel free to tweet at us about what you like or don't like in the podcast. We will be paying attention and we will listen. If you're listening through iTunes, perhaps leave us a rating and a review as well. War and Peace is part of the Europod Network. Check out some of their other podcasts on a variety of European topics.
And a big thanks to producers, Bull Media, and to Miranda Sonnex, who has been such an able coordinator and inspiration for these podcasts. I'm not sure how we're going to keep this going without her now that she's moved on. But the biggest thanks, as always, go to you, our listeners, and we look forward to chatting with you again in two weeks. With that, I'll say goodbye. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.